The following podcast contains discussions of rampant animal abuse, cheating, suicide, sexual assault, and violence. Woof. Also, spoilers. Lots of spoilers. Ready? Let's dig in. At first, when she hears the cries from the Great Hall, she thinks the worst. But as she approaches to see the commotion, she begins to hear the joy in each shriek, each whoop, and each cheer. Her heart is pounding with each step and she hopes that her prayers have finally come true. That the man she loves has finally returned to her. And there he is, smiling, looking tired and slightly unwell. She moves closer and closer still, so near that they can almost touch. It had been so long since they had breathed the same air together. She wants to take him in her arms, embrace him, kiss him, and never let go. But she can't. Not while every eye in the court is on them. Not while her husband is watching. Ooh, drama! Hi, I'm Gabby, and this is Digestibles, a podcast about all the books you were told to read but probably didn't. And today, we're breaking down the story of Lancelot and Guinevere. Like most myths and legends, there are multiple sources that contributed to the stories as we know them now. For this episode, we'll concentrate on a romance by 12th century French poet Clétaine de Troyes called The Knights of the Cart. But before we get into it, a little background. The term romance in medieval literature is different from the romance genre that we know and love. They're more like adventure stories, similar to folktales, where heroes go on a quest to prove that, baby, they're worth it. Kind of like Dungeons and Dragons, so think of knights and wizards, dragons, and damsels in distress. Oof, so many damsels in distress. Detois' Arthurian romances, there are five by the way, are important because even though he wasn't the first to write about it, he was the first to call Arthur's kingdom Camelot, the first to mention the quest for the Holy Grail, and the first to introduce the forbidden love between Lancelot and Guinevere. So, let's get on with it, shall we? Our tale begins on Ascension Day, the 40th day of Easter, when Jesus ascends into heaven. There's a feast in Camelot to celebrate. All knights and ladies and the nobles of the court are there. It's noted that unlike his usual habit of making a French exit during festivities, King Arthur actually stays after the meal. Wow, he's gonna regret that because in comes a knight who just screams stranger danger. And I'll interrupt a bit to warn you that there are too many knights on this dance floor and most of them don't have names, so I'm just going to give them nicknames as we go along to try to make it easier for everyone. Let's call this guy the Bad Knight. So the Bad Knight, being bad, doesn't smile or join in on the festivities. He just goes straight up to Arthur and says, Hey, I've kidnapped some of your knights and ladies, and I bet you can't rescue them. And Arthur is like, Hey, bro. He just gives up almost immediately. The Bad Knight starts to leave, but just as he reaches the door, he stops and adds, Well, since you're a coward, maybe you know someone who isn't? Ooh, boy. He challenges the king to give the queen to his most trusted knight and follow him into the woods. He'll surrender his captives if the king can defend the queen and bring her back to Camelot. In the middle of all the confusion, a knight called Kay goes to the king and decides that this would be a good time to hand in his resignation. Actual quote from the king? Is this serious or a joke? Everyone gangs up on Kay because his timing just sucks. Maybe he's hangry or tired of being overworked and underpaid. The queen then kneels, bows her head before him and says that she won't ever get up until he promises to stay. Excellent emotional manipulation there, Guinevere. Kay gives in and they owe him a favor now. Kay says he wants to answer the Bad Knight's challenge if the king will trust him to keep the queen safe. The king reluctantly agrees even though he really wasn't planning on rescuing the hostages. <laughs> wow, what an awesome leader. The queen is bummed too because everyone is acting like she's already dead. Before she goes, she whispers something strange to her horse. If only you know, you'd never let me be led away. A noble overhears this but does not comment. Something's rotten in Camelot. The king's nephew, Gawain, has a brilliant idea and says that maybe they should be following Kay. 
The king agrees and Gawain, always thinking in advance, decides to bring extra horses. Just as the knights are approaching the forest, they see Kay's horse running out, wild and frantic. His bridle is broken and the stirrup is stained with blood. Uh-oh. Gawain rides ahead. He sees a knight on a horse that's looking tired and spent. The knight greets Gawain and asks if he can borrow one of his extra horses since his is dying. Gawain agrees and the knight jumps on the nearest horse and rides off into the forest. Gawain follows this mysterious knight and, during the chase, finds the horse he gave him dead. This guy seems to be the opposite of a horse whisperer. Anyway, Gawain soon catches up to Sir Horse Murderer who's standing in front of a cart. Back then, a cart was needed for more than just groceries. It was also used for criminals. Murderers, thieves, and traitors were put on a cart and dragged through the streets and throughout cities to shame them. Because of this, I guess you can say that anyone who gets put on a cart gets cancelled for life. The driver of the cart happens to be a dwarf and the knight is talking to him. He's asking if he knows where the queen was taken. The dwarf won't answer him but tells him, If you get on this cart, I will take you there. Sir Animal Rights Don't Matter may be a jerk, but is he an add-to-cart kind of jerk? Let's see. The knight hesitated only for a couple of steps before getting in. Yet, it was unlucky for him that he shrank from the disgrace and did not jump in at once, or he will later rue his delay. But common sense which is inconsistent with love's dictates, bids him refrain from getting in, warning him and counseling him to do and undertake nothing for which he may reap shame and disgrace. Reason, which dares thus speak to him, reaches only his lips, but not his heart. But love is enclosed within his heart, bidding him and urging him to mount at once upon the cart. So he jumps in, since love will have it so feeling no concern about the shame, since he is prompted by love's commands. And so we meet the hero of our story. You've probably guessed who he is by now, but there's a reason why he remains unnamed, so I'll just refer to him as the Knight of the Cart. Gawain approaches them and also asks the dwarf about the queen. The dwarf tells him there's room in the cart. Gawain's like, no way, he's not crazy enough to do that, so he decides to follow them instead. From here on, the story becomes very episodic, where the Knight of the Cart moves from one place to another, is given a sort of test to prove his chivalry or honor or whatever, it gets very repetitive, but hey, I'm here to help you out with that. First, we have the lady with the bed. The dwarf brings them to a castle where beds are prepared for him and Gawain, but the lady of the castle also prepares a much nicer bed inside their room and forbids them to use it. The knight of the cart goes, no, the bed is there and I'm going to sleep in it. Gee, entitled much? The lady is like, well, you're gonna regret it. While sleeping, a flaming lance suddenly appears from above and pins the knight to the bed. It catches fire and the knight wakes up. He takes the lance and flings it across the room like a pesky alarm he puts on snooze before going back to sleep. The next day, the knight is looking dramatically outside a window when he sees a funeral procession happening down below. One lady catches his eye. It's the queen. He tries to jump out of the window to get her, but Gawain stops him and they leave. While in pursuit, they meet a girl at a crossroads. She agrees to tell them about the queen if they will grant her a favor in the future. Okay, sounds kinda sketchy to me. We don't make deals with random strangers at crossroads. She then explains that the bad knight is Meliagon, son of King Badmagu of Gaul, who has taken the queen back to his kingdom where no one who enters ever returns from. Even worse, there are only two other ways to get inside without permission from the king the sword bridge and the water bridge. If you're thinking, well, that sounds dangerous, then you are correct, my friend. 
The water bridge is the safer option though because people tend to drown in it while the sword bridge is the faster option but it has never been crossed. Ever. The Knight of the Cart gives Gawain the choice and he picks the water bridge. They go their separate ways. You soon realize that our Knight of the Cart has two basic settings, Fight Mode and Fantasy Mode. In Fight Mode, he's violent and practically unbeatable. In Fantasy Mode, he's always thinking about the woman he loves that he barely pays attention to anything else. Like the fact that his horse is thirsty from all that dashing around. Seriously, why do people keep handing this guy horses? So while he's busy daydreaming, his horse wanders into a river that's being guarded by a knight. Another knight. The river knight shouts in warning, Don't cross, you'll die! But the knight of the cart isn't listening. The river knight calls out three times. Our knight still doesn't hear. The river knight races towards him and hits him so hard he falls into the water. The knight of the cart is mad because, Bro, why you gotta do me like that? Bro. This activates his fight mode and soon, the river knight is begging for his life. The Knight of the Cart wants to take him prisoner, but someone familiar stops him and asks for mercy. She's the girl at the crossroads. He agrees because he owes her a favor. Moving onward, he bumps into another lady. She's beautiful and elegantly dressed. She offers him the use of her house on the condition that he sleeps with her. Ooh. He tries to refuse, but eventually agrees. She brings him to her house, and as she's preparing for bed, he hears her screaming. Rushing in, he sees a knight holding her down while others are standing guard. And our hero thinks that this is the perfect time to have a long internal monologue about stuff like honor and courage and love and shame. He finally decides that yeah, maybe he should help a woman not get attacked. Yay? He shouts the medieval equivalent of come at me bro and attacks the men when the lady suddenly snaps her fingers and everyone stops. Turns out it was a test. Yikes. He's not amused, but he made her a promise, so he follows her to the bed. He tries as hard not to touch her or even look at her. The knight has only one heart. And this one is really no longer his, but has been entrusted to someone else so that he cannot bestow it elsewhere. Love, which holds all hearts beneath its sway, requires it to be lodged in a single place. All hearts? No, only those which it esteems. And he whom love deigns to control ought to prize himself the more. Love prized his heart so highly that it constrained it in a special manner, and made him so proud of this distinction that I am not inclined to find fault with him, if he lets alone what love forbids and remains fixed where it desires. The maiden clearly sees and knows that he dislikes her company and would gladly dispense with it, and that, having no desire to win her love, he would not attempt to woo her. So she said, My lord, if you will not feel hurt, I will leave and return to bed in my own room, and you will be more comfortable. I do not believe that you are pleased with my company and society. Do not esteem me less if I tell you what I think. Now take your rest all night, for you have so well kept your promise that I have no right to make further request of you. So I commend you to God and shall go away. The next morning, the lady asks if she can join the knight on his journey. She tries to talk to him, but he's in fantasy mode again and isn't paying attention. Good thing this is fiction because how does he even function in the real world? I mean, <laughs> I get you, boy. They come across a meadow with a spring and a stone in it. The lady sees something in the stone and decides to go another way. Because his head is in the clouds, the knight just follows her around until he realizes he's not on the right path. 
They return to the meadow. He sees what the lady doesn't want him to see. It's... a comb. I mean, it's a beautiful comb. The most beautiful comb that the knight has ever seen. He picks it up and notices that there are hairs caught in it. He stares at the golden strands for a long time until the lady laughs and says that she's sure that the comb belongs to Queen Guinevere. When he hears this, he feels faint and almost falls over his horse. The lady dismounts to help him, but he's embarrassed because it's not manly or against the coat of knights or something. She soothes his ego by saying she was reaching for the comb. He pulls out the hairs from the comb very carefully and places them on his chest near his heart. This is not at all creepy. They reach a narrow path and a knight approaches them. Another knight. She recognizes him as a suitor she's turned down many times. Sir Friendzone challenges the knight of the cart because there's this custom they follow that if you're defeated by a knight while escorting a lady, the knight is free to claim her. Weird rule, but okay. They look for a place where they can fight better and they find a meadow where some sort of celebration is going on. They're singing and dancing and people doing sports. Sir Friendzone goes up to an older knight. It's his dad. He boasts that he's finally won the woman he loves and dad knight is like, Really? Why is that knight still hanging around then? They argue and the knight of the cart and the lady make a quick exit. They ride until they reach a church. The knight enters to pray and he sees a monk who shows him a graveyard. In the cemetery are magnificent gravestones carved with many familiar names. Gawain, Louis, Yvain. Knights from King Arthur's court. He looks around and sees the biggest, most beautiful tomb of all exquisitely carved out of marble. He asks the monk whom it's for. The monk says whoever can lift the lid of the tomb. And P.S. that guy, whoever he is, is destined to free all the captives in the land of Gaul. The knight grasps the stone and raises it without any trouble. Easy peasy. The monk looks at him with his surprised Pikachu face and asks for his name. The knight refuses to say though. He goes, but because of this feat, the lady is also curious about who he is now. Her questions annoy him, so he ditches her. Alone again, our hero meets another knight who tells him of a quicker path to the sword bridge. It's called the Stony Path, but it's very well guarded and very dangerous. The knight of the cart laughs at the warning because danger is like his middle name or something. Two of the knight's sons volunteer to take our knight of the cart there. They leave at dawn and when they arrive at the path, another knight immediately appears and... I think you get the pattern of the story now. Some metalhead wants to fight, but our hero is too good at it and always wins. Awesome. Wow. Later on, they meet a squire. He tells them that a great knight has inspired all the captives to rise up and that they should help them. Our hero, who has never met a fight he doesn't want to fling himself face first into, follows the squire and as soon as they arrive in the fortress, the gate shuts behind them. It's a trap! At first, they think there's magic involved. It just so happens that the knight of the cart has a magic ring given to him by a fairy who raised him. This ring can undo any enchantment at work around him, but when he tries to use it, nothing happens. They manage to escape without magic and join the battle outside the prison. The knight of the cart defeats everyone he meets, of course. Yawn. After the victory, the men invite the knight to stay and for two days they celebrate. On the third day, a proud knight questions the king of the cart's hero status. Because, well, he once rode a cart. They solve the argument in the usual masculine fashion and it's so bloody that the knight of the cart gets his horse killed. Again. <sighs> As usual. The knight of the cart overpowers his opponent and the punishment would be to make him ride a cart. The proud knight would rather die because he's proud. And then, plot twist, a mysterious lady rides up and offers the knight of the cart a great reward if he gives her the proud knight's head. The knight of the cart suggests a rematch, this time to death. Obviously, the proud knight loses, so the mysterious lady gets her head and she promises to repay our knight someday. The knight feels he's delayed long enough so he continues to the sword bridge. And you guessed it, it's a shining sword. Long and wide and stiff, and maybe it's a metaphor for something, I don't know. Below it, a bottomless black water threatens to swallow anyone who falls. Worse, there's a pair of lions waiting on the other side of the bridge. His companions try to convince him not to cross. The blade is too sharp, the wind is too strong, and duh, lions. 
But the knight of the cart is determined and he trusts that his faith will lead him to his love. And he, laughing, replies to them, Receive my thanks and gratitude for the concern you feel for me. It comes from your love and kind hearts. I know full well that you would not like to see any mishap come to me, but I have faith and confidence in God that he will protect me to the end. I fear the bridge and stream no more than I fear this dry land, so I intend to prepare and make the dangerous attempt to cross. I would rather die than turn back now. The others have nothing more to say, but each weeps with pity and heaves a sigh. Meanwhile, he prepares, as best he may, to cross the stream. And he does a very marvelous thing in removing the armor from his feet and hands. He will be in a sorry state when he reaches the other side. He is going to support himself with his bare hands and feet upon the sword, which was sharper than a scythe. For he had not kept on his feet either sole or upper or hose, but he felt no fear of wounds upon his hands or feet. He preferred to maim himself rather than to fall from the bridge and be plunged in the water from which he could never escape. In accordance with his determination, he passes over with great pain and agony, being wounded in the hands, knees, and feet. But even this suffering is sweet to him, for love, who conducts and leads him on, assuages and relieves the pain. Bleeding, our knight reaches the other side and remembers the lions. He looks around, but poof, they're gone. Remember his fairy ring? The lions aren't real, they're just magic. Overlooking the bridge is an incredible tower. At the window, the king and his son have witnessed the knight perform this impossible thing. The king is impressed while the son is furious. The king offers the knight time to rest and recover, but the knight will not delay and they decide to duel at dawn. For the first time in this story, our knight has met his equal. The fight is long and dirty, neither giving the other a chance to win. The knight of the cart begins to weaken. A young girl in the audience runs to the queen and begs for his name so that she can encourage him. The queen reveals that he's called Lancelot of the Lake. The young girl calls out to let him know that the queen is watching. Lancelot turns and sees the face of his beloved and he starts winning. The king, realizing that his son might lose, pleads with Guinevere for mercy. She grants it and somehow Lancelot hears this from far away while he's in the middle of a brawl. He stops fighting. Meliagant sees an opening and strikes him and is about to do it again when the king rushes into the field to save him from dishonor. The king agrees to release the prisoners if Lancelot gives Meliagant the right to challenge him again at any time within the year because that's just the man thing to do. The lovers are finally reunited, but Guinevere is acting strange. She refuses to look at Lancelot or even speak to him. Kay, who's been held prisoner with the queen, has no idea why she's acting weird either. Lancelot shrugs it off and decides to go out and search for Gawain. While away, word reaches the king that Lancelot is dead. Guinevere is so upset that she stops eating and drinking for two days. She regrets the way she treated Lancelot. Meanwhile, news reaches Lancelot that Guinevere has died in grief. He tries to kill himself, but his companions save him. Soon enough, they learn that all the rumors are false and Lancelot joyfully returns to his queen. Guinevere explains that she snubbed him before because she knows he hesitated to ride the cart even though he knew it would lead him to her. He hesitated for like three seconds, give the man a break. He asks for forgiveness and she gives it. When everyone is asleep, Lancelot goes to Guinevere's room. There are iron bars at the window, but that won't stop our hero. Using his strength, he bends the iron until he can enter. He doesn't notice that it cuts his fingers because he's too busy sleeping with Guinevere. Oh, and Kay is right there in the room with them. Thankfully, he remains asleep. Cut to the next morning, 
Lancelot sneaks out and puts the iron bars back in place. However, he doesn't notice that his blood has stained Guinevere's bed. Meliagon comes in to check on the queen and he sees the blood on the bed. Kay's wounds had been bleeding all over his bed as well, so Meliagon adds two and two and ends up with five. He brings the queen before his father, accusing her and Kay of adultery. Guinevere and Kay defend their honor, but the king sees the evidence and believes his son. Meliagon wants Kay punished and Guinevere shamed. Kay asks for a trial by combat, but he's still too weak, so Guinevere asks Lancelot to fight in his stead. When the oaths had been taken, their horses were brought forward, which were fair and good in every way. Each man mounts his own home, and they ride at once at each other as fast as the steeds can carry them. And when the horses are in mid-career, the knights strike each other so fiercely that there is nothing left of the lances in their hands. Each brings the other to earth, however they are not dismayed but they rise at once and attack each other with their sharp-drawn swords. The burning sparks fly in the air from their helmets. They assail each other so bitterly with the drawn swords in their hands that, as they thrust and draw, they encounter each other with their blows and will not pause even to catch their breath. The king in his grief and anxiety called the queen, who had gone up in the tower to look out from the balcony. He begged her for God's sake, the creator, to let them be separated. Whatever is your pleasure is agreeable to me, the queen says honestly. I shall not object to anything you do. So the fight turns out exactly like the last time, with Lancelot winning, the king asking Guinevere for mercy, and Meliagon trying to cheat. The king convinces his son to take revenge in a year, just like they initially agreed. Lancelot leaves again to search for Gawain. He meets a dwarf who offers to guide him. Lancelot follows the dwarf and gets himself kidnapped. His companions realize he's missing, but at least they find Gawain. He's trapped under the water bridge, so they go rescue him and explain the situation. They go back to the castle. The queen is especially saddened by this news. Everyone suspects Meliagont is behind the kidnapping because it's his MO, but they can't confront him without proof. Not long after, a letter arrives bearing Lancelot's seal. It says he's safe in Camelot and that Guinevere, Kay, and Gawain should return as well. They're relieved and go home immediately. When they get there, they find out that Lancelot is still MIA. A tournament is held in Camelot, with the queen presiding. Lancelot hears of it and pleads with his jailer's wife to let him attend. He promises to come back after. At first, she's frightened of Meliagont and her husband, but she eventually lets him go and lends him armor and a horse. Aw, somebody take that horse away quick! Lancelot competes and is doing well. Guinevere suspects that this mysterious knight is her lover, so to test him, she sends a young girl to him with a message asking him to fight badly. Lancelot obeys. 
the next day, Guinevere sends another message, this time to fight as well as he can. Lancelot, to no one's surprise, wins the tournament but departs before people can learn his identity. He returns to his prison where Meliagant waits for him, making sure that he won't escape again. Meliagant then writes to Camelot to demand that Lancelot honor his promise to fight him. Hey, third time's a charm. Especially when you've made sure your rival is unable to attend. Gawain offers to fight for Lancelot if he's still missing in a year. Meleagant returns to his kingdom, Gor, and boasts that Lancelot is frightened of him. King Badmigu does not believe a word of it. Meleagant storms away in anger. His sister overhears this and swears she'll find Lancelot and free him. This is the lady who had asked for the Proud Knight's head and still owes Lancelot a service. She travels for more than a month, searching far and wide until one day, she sees a tower by the sea with no other houses beside it. She knows in her heart that this is where Lancelot is being kept. The tower has no door, no ladder, and no way to go inside. She hears a voice moaning from inside, begging to die. She calls his name until he hears and looks out. She identifies herself and tells him she's here to pay her debt. She finds a small axe and hands it to him. He uses it against the window until he can escape. Lancelot is too weak to walk, so she takes him to one of her mansions and nurses him until he's well enough to fight. Lancelot returns to Camelot just as Meliagant also appears to fight Gawain. Everyone is overjoyed, Guinevere especially, though she can't show it because the court is watching. Lancelot insists that he should be the one to fight Meliagant himself. Meliagant knows he's going to lose but is too proud to beg for his life. So Lancelot cuts off his arm and eventually his head. The world celebrates his death and our tale ends with everyone getting what they deserve. Except for all those poor dead horses. So Guinevere's just chillin', minding her own business as King Arthur's wife and Queen of Camelot, when Clotonde de Troyes thinks, you know what would make this story better? A love triangle. Hey, if it worked for Twilight. And throughout history, fiction or otherwise, we've always had a fascination with love triangles. We can hardly escape them in books, movies, and TV shows, even in real life. One of more interesting graffiti that survived Pompeii is a short exchange between Severus and Successus, who are fighting over a barmaid named Iris. It was a love triangle so strong, it literally couldn't be destroyed by a volcanic eruption. I'm paraphrasing, but Severus writes, Successus loves Iris who doesn't love him. Pathetic. Bye. Successus replies, You're just jealous. I'm more handsome. Then Severus claps back with, I said what I said. You love her, but she doesn't love you. And that's on what? Period. Ah, yes. Life may be short, but petty is forever. Speaking of petty... There's King Henry VIII rewriting laws and exchanging England's religion just so he could divorce Catherine of Aragon to marry Anne Boleyn. Fast forward a few centuries later and we have Prince Charles, Diana, and Camilla Parker Bowles. A love triangle that played out in the tabloids to everyone's glee proving that we're all just messy benches who love the drama. Ah, and how can we forget the whole Justin Bieber, Selena Gomez, Haley Baldwin saga? They're on again, off again, he's with her now. Wait, are they on again? Narrative is seemingly over now that Justin and Haley are married, but eh, who knows with these kids. This has been going on since 2009. That's a whole decade. Have any of these people considered just embracing the three-coupledom? Thripledom? You know, polyamory? No? That's, that's not a thing? Well, sadly, not all love triangles are created equal. Though the affair of Lancelot and Guinevere can go from bad to worse, depending on who's writing, it's hard to find a more epic love triangle to ever... triangle. After all, it ends in tears, bloodshed, and actual home wrecking, with Camelot destroyed and the round table, symbol of brotherhood, honor, and all that is good, etc., etc., broken. Oops. So the next time you find yourself in a love triangle, 
be very glad that it's not this one. Oh, and, and since you're already here, Team Pita, Team Edward, Team Cyrano, and Zutara for life. Okay, I know it wasn't exactly a love triangle, but it should have been. <laughs> it would have worked. And anyone who says otherwise is wrong, and you can sit there in your wrongness, so goodbye. And there we have it! Thanks again for listening, you guys. I hope I made the romance of Lancelot a little bit easier for you to digest. Once again, I'm Gabby, and you can find me at Gabby Pasco Box on Instagram and Twitter, or use the hashtag DigestiblesPodcast. Thanks again to Thor for helping out with the narrations, and Jazz for composing our theme. Don't forget to tune in next week! Digestibles is part of Connect, a podcast network, bringing together entertaining stories to spark your imagination. For more awesome content, follow us on social media at Connect Podcasts.